Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, today, as you already got the intro, we're looking at Elijah and his unfinished business. Um, one of the, Elijah was one of the most important prophets of the Old Testament. In fact, he was a first ballot Hall of Famer, no question. Elijah was also a man of action. Uh, you might be familiar with some stories from Elijah's time, perhaps the story of Elijah taking on 900 prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel, or the time Elijah saved a widow and her son in a foreign land, or when he was fed not by Grubhub, but delivered food by ravens in the wilderness. Uh, Moses was the guy who ushered in the commandments and the constitution or covenant or contract, all these words really fit. He was the one who ushered in these things from Israel directly from Yahweh. But Elijah, the other guy at the Mount of Transfiguration, Elijah was the guy who came to troubleshoot when God's people started to mess things up, in particular when the kings started to mess things up. Elijah called Israel's kings to get back on track, and he came not just with empty threats, but with power, like taking away rain, and proofs of authenticity from Yahweh himself. Elijah was sent to warn the northern kingdom of Israel to stop worshiping idols, among other things. And he went to rebuke King Ahab for misleading the nation. Ahab was far from the only wicked king of Judah or Israel, but Ahab and Queen Jezebel were the epitome of wicked and wayward kings. Aside from a few notable exceptions, such as King David, Hezekiah, and Josiah, who each had some faults of their own too, these, the, king, the rest of the kings were selfish, immoral, idolatrous, and often petty. They were much more concerned with their own pleasure and power than Yahweh's will. They were much more concerned with their own reign than seeing God's reign come. So, since these kings were not leading the people to follow after Yahweh, Yahweh sent the prophets to do two things. Um, first, to try to get the kings to correct their course. This would hopefully go a long way to help getting the nation back on track, right? I mean, that's not an uncommon way. You try to fix the leaders and hope that the nation will follow. That's what Yahweh did too. Since the king was in a very public leadership role, the prophets did not come to the king privately. No, they did so in a very public way. And that was also to do the whole nation a service, letting them see what God had to say about the national state of affairs. This, in fact, was the second prof task of the prophets to let all the people know what God really said and thought about what was going on. This was necessary because the kings who were kind of supposed to be doing that weren't doing that. But Yahweh wanted to make sure that his people did hear what he was saying. Sometimes they told people what was going to happen in the future or what they should do. But a lot of times they simply told people what God had to say about what was going on right then. When the first task that prophets were given, correcting the kings, failed, then speaking to the rest of the people became even more important. Um, however, there's a bigger picture from, our, from this story that's about the prophets, and at first glance, it's rather disheartening. Um, Elijah comes to, out, to call Ahab to task, and Elijah does outlast King Ahab. Eventually, Ahab dies in battle, but even with Ahab's death, things didn't improve. If, if Elijah was expecting a break, after Ahab's death, he was sorely disappointed. Ahab's son and then future kings of Israel would continue to be unfaithful, immoral, and idolatrous. Despite all of Elijah's hard work, 
The same basic problem remains. Eve green after Ahab is gone. The kings, who are supposed to be the best, the leaders of God's people, are still prone to unfaithfulness. Getting rid of the bad ones turns out to be a never-ending task. And so eventually, Yahweh kind of just moves on from Israel's kings. Now, he, he doesn't move on from Judah's kings entirely, but that's pretty much because he's promised not to, not because they don't deserve it. Uh, but you can see all this, this in the mission of Elisha, who uh, takes over for Elijah in the northern kingdom of Israel. And which, you know, finally now brings us to the story that we had for today. Um, Yahweh has made it known that Elijah is eligible for early retirement. And it's common knowledge among the prophets, at least, and the sons of the prophet, whoever they are exactly, that Elijah is going to be taking God up on the offer. However, because of that, Yahweh has designated Elisha as an heir for Elijah. Elijah was not going to die, but instead, he had, because he had been all that he had been through, Yahweh was going to be faithful to Elijah. He will disappear into heaven on chariots of fire with only Elisha as a witness. But Yahweh still needs a replacement to carry out the work because the work is still there. However, interesting, a little interesting little tidbit that I couldn't help but comment on a little bit. Elijah tries to discourage Elisha from following him um, three times, right? But each time Elisha remains committed to the task. Um, and this is you know, a little interesting that initially Elisha's when Elijah first calls Elijah, when Elijah first calls Elisha, he's plowing, and he wants to finish what he's doing, and Elijah says, whatever, okay, finish what you're doing. But he kind of moves on, and the point is, you're going to follow me or don't. don't. Don't mess around. Don't get off the fence and stop plowing, and then Elisha gets the point. But now Elijah tell, asks Elisha three times. He tells him to, that don't go any further. You don't, you don't want to go any further. Um, but each time, Elisha remains committed to the task. Which, and what's the point here? It's important because this is not going to be an easy task. Elijah's mantle, it's a cool concept, but it's not an easy task. And Elisha's going to have to be able to be committed and deal with some discouragement. He'll need grit and determination even when he's discouraged or questioned like Elijah does Elisha. And fast forward to Jesus in the New Testament, he likewise challenges people when they follow him. There's this story in the Gospels of three different people who come to Jesus and want to follow him, and he says, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no... Maybe you're familiar with that story. And the end result is these three people come to Jesus, and he, keep, kind of make, he makes it kind of hard for them. He, makes it, he doesn't make it easier. He says, you need to really buckle down and follow me or don't bother. Um, in a similar sort of vein, Peter attempts to follow Jesus to the cross, but Jesus predicts, and then it comes to, to fruition, that Peter denies him three times. And then here's the real point. Eventually, at Resurrection Beach, after Jesus is resurrected and the disciples see him, they're fishing, and they jump on shore. Jesus has made them some fish. Um, he, at, Jesus asks Peter again, in a similar sort of vein, three times if Peter loves him, and if so, that he should be the leader to take care of uh, sharing the gospel and leading God's people. Uh, so it's kind of like Jesus is, in a sense, passing things off um, to Peter and to the apostles to share his message. Um, well, anyways, back to Elijah and Elisha. Elisha is given the spirit of Elijah, which is really you know, the Holy Spirit of Yahweh. He will pick up exactly where Elijah left off. And Elijah had tons of work, right? But he leaves, and he worked a lot, but he leaves a lot of unfinished business behind. And so it's funny that, however, and so Elisha picks up his mantle, but it's kind of funny that the, 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 Elisha's mission shifts a little bit from Elijah. Elisha, I was reading through this, and uh, Elisha never really goes back to the kings of Israel. He avoids the kings. Anytime they interact with him, he sort of does so unwillingly. He doesn't personally interact with them. And that's because 
In Israel's case, Yahweh has already moved on from the kings. They are obstinate and have proved that they will not repent. So God has let them have exactly what they want. He will no longer visit them or help them or give them any sort of instructions or guidance. Instead of worrying about kings, Elisha's ministry is more focused on the people of Israel than the kings of Israel. The focus of Yahweh's salvation has shifted from officials and king and government to simply the faithful people in Israel. However, um, even Elisha's ministry did not fully wrap things up when he made he did all kinds of spectacular things. He made axe heads float. He would make he made a stew that would make Gordon Ramsay jealous, the way he transformed it from a terrible, deathly stew to a tasty stew. He raised the dead, healed leprosy, delivered the nation, but even at his death, the fundamental problems still are there. In fact, things never truly get resolved in the Old Testament. And at Elisha's death, God's people are still unfaithful and idolatrous, and their leaders still aren't helping. This is a point, there's a point that something is not right, and no matter what God does in this way, things are not getting fixed. Things will not get fixed, except by a couple people. There's these rare exceptions in the Old Testament, like Moses, David, Elijah, and Elisha, and there's a common denominator amongst all those. It's that the Bible mentions the Spirit of of Yahweh. And a sneak peek at the New Testament, that's the only way things change. It's not by outside actions without the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit being given to God's people, to you and me, that allows us to change. Elijah and Elisha's mission, the mission of the prophets in general, was unfinished. And that's why even later in the Old Testament, Malachi, for instance, talked about how it would be necessary for an Elijah-like figure to return to fix things. Because Elijah had unfinished business, so makes sense that the Elijah would have to come back and carry out his mission. Which uh, is one reason why Elijah shows up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Um, now, I don't know exactly what um, Elijah and Moses and Jesus talked about. Maybe they were swapping horror stories, or, or maybe they were swapping success stories. But irregardless of the specifics, the point is, Elijah and Moses, we're not focusing on Moses for today, Elijah had unfinished business, but he's leaving it to Jesus to finish. Jesus has come to finish the unfinished business of the Old Testament. He has come to restore the nation, to heal the people, to bring judgment against the wicked rulers of the world. Only, it would not be limited to the religious and political leaders, although they might get caught up in the wash if they refuse to repent. But God um, came, uh, was moving on from, uh, to bring judgment against um, what the Bible calls the prince of this world, the devil. God was moving on, and Jesus is moving on, from relying on the kings of Israel because now we've got something better. Yahweh himself, the Son of God incarnate, has come once again to be our king. And Jesus didn't really target specific human rulers like Elijah did Ahab. Rather, Jesus came to judge and overthrow the devil. And just like Yahweh eventually gave up on changing kings in Israel and sent Elisha to help the people, Jesus never really bothers himself that much with leaders like Herod or Pontius Pilate. Instead, he comes to save the people, not to save a, a political structure or nation or ruler. Jesus really pays little attention and in some cases, gives even less respect to the kings of his day. His primary concern is not really to adjust rules, 
but to change hearts. He has no intent of saving existing structures simply for their own sake. He's there, rather, to fix the world and the people, not to prop up leaders because he has come to be the new king of God's people and eventually the king of all creation. And that's what Jesus' primary concern is even to this day. Jesus cares more about the hearts of his people. He cares more about you and me, the church, than he does any particular ruling country or nation. God's kingdom can't and won't be stopped by anybody. God's kingdom comes through Christ, through the cross and the forgiveness of sins. It may seem odd to this world, and it's not the way this world views things, but you and I are more important to God than the kings of this world. The church is more important to God than nations are. God, you see, God's primary concern is not uh, the state, is not that the state is Christian. Although it's certainly better for society, right, when there are good rulers and there are good rulers, rules. Good rulers and good rules, those are good things. But God's primary concern is really the state of his people. That is the church and Christians, you and me. We rank higher on God's priority list. Now, we're not always guaranteed that we'll have the rulers that we want or that the laws of the land will be perfect. But we do have the example of the New Testament that overcoming evil is not a matter of simply, of simply getting rid of one bad ruler. No, it's much deeper. It's a matter of the heart. And the solution comes through the Holy Spirit renewing hearts in Christ. While we are not guaranteed perfect rulers in this world, we are guaranteed that the kingdom of God will not be overthrown. And I guess we are guaranteed a perfect ruler in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Jesus himself has guaranteed us the victory over evil by sending you and me, the same Holy Spirit, to renew our lives, to renew our hearts and minds, uh, solving, giving us the real solution to evil and to the ills of this world by starting right here with you and me. Right here in this humble congregation, along with all the places where Christians are dispersed and planted throughout the world, is where God's victorious kingdom of God can be found. We remember that we are guaranteed that our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there. In Jesus' name, amen.